of the things that I know that I feel so deeply and I have felt since I have known you is that you are going to be known around the world. It's just all part of who you are. You're, because there is both the message and the messenger. And you, are, you have such an evocative message and you have such a wonderful way of delivering it. But, oh, by the way, this is my friend, <laughs> David Keith. Lindsay Berkson, Dr. Berkson, functional medicine. We're not going to talk about that. We're, <laughs> well, we may talk about it. But the main thing I want to know is, is that you, did you, when did you know you were a performer? Because we go to a comedy club. We both belong to a comedy club. And we work. When did you know that you were a performer and that you loved performing and getting in front of people? In the womb, it was fetal. It was a womb with a view. <laughs> so all of the people in my family have oration or theater or looking at the world and trying to figure it out and then talking about it in our genes. Yes. My mother was a, was a, a musical playwright. My father was an actor before he became a lawyer. My brother headed a speech and theater department for many years. My grandfather, who came over from Russia that could barely speak English, would get a little soapbox. <laughs> In those days, they called it a soapbox, right? And he would take the soapbox from the house. He had a little place where he kept it. And there were little, tiny little apartment. They hardly had any money. They were the poor side of the family. In and New York? He, it, in Chicago. In Chicago. Same thing a lot of people yeah. in Texas say. Got it. <laughs> he'd take this little soapbox and he'd put it down in the center of a park and he'd stand on it and just talk, just to talk. He had to talk. So everyone in my family, we got to talk. And then I come from a, a Jewish uh, family, even though I love Christ and I'm a spiritual mutt, so to speak, and have lived in India and in ashrams and so forth, always seeking to see how others look at the answers. Um, uh, what was it? We were well. We were just talking about you being a performer and knowing. I mean, did you did you do musicals in school? Did you do did you do acting in school? Did you come everything, to this and everything? I have always acted. I when I went to Michigan, I always knew I wanted to be in medicine and I always knew I wanted to be in media. So my very first um, bachelor degrees, one was in psycho. Um, neurology and I worked in James Olds, Olds lab that learned all about satiety center in the brain and pleasure versus non-pleasure so I was real heavy into psych and biological psych yeah. and then I got a degree in theater radio TV and media and I went from there I always knew it was both and when I was in grammar school high school I was in the debating club I was in all the um, acting uh, plays and when I graduated college to take a break I was an actress and I got a job as a lead ingenue in Arena Stage, which is a very big, legit theater in D.C. And so my whole life has been intertwined with service through health and figuring a way of delivering that message so that people hear it and grasp it so they can act on it. Your spirituality and what I find interesting here in 2018, here we are at the end of 2018, beginning into 2019, we understand that authors and, and must promote themselves because they must be able to speak about what they're doing and speak about where they're going. You're getting, how, how do you see at this time with getting the kind of attention that you're getting, you're beginning, you go to these conferences, you become the star of these <laughs> conferences in, in, in functional medicine. You're going to be on, a, you're going to be on a, the dais with uh, Marianne Williamson that is coming up. And that, so uh, this, is, this is something that is really evolving and you're getting a chance to experience Well, now. just to give a little joke on that answer, I love that line in Steel Magnolias where Olivia Dukakis says, what separates us from the mammals is our ability to accessorize. <laughs> so perhaps I'm just, with my message, accessorizing in a successful and effective manner. <laughs> I don't really know if I'm really getting as much attention as, you, as you're saying, but... Um, well, it appears this way from the outside. Okay. What's very 
odd that today if you want a message with all the cacophony that's in cyberspace. So when I first had my very first book out in 1979, it was sold three quarters of a million. It was easy because there was no competition. So now fast forward many decades later, there's competition everywhere. Mm -hmm. So if you feel a fire in your belly that you have this passion and mission that you want to get out there, you somehow have to figure out how to brand yourself to be heard above the cacophony. It's the oddest thing. So you have the thing of that which you're good at, and then you have to have a, a lubed message so that it exactly. soars into the universe in some and way. That's what you're having. So so how are, how is that dawning to you? What what is the message that you're that you're carrying? Well, first of all, it's hard work. It's I love when the Dalai Lama was asked about what is happiness. And he says it's discipline. And I understood deeply what he meant. And anything that you own and really hope to create and manifest comes with a heck of a lot of vitamin D, discipline, and mm -hmm. hard work. So I've been working for decades combining medicine and health along with media and trying it every which way in different portals to get into it. But what, um, at this time you're saying, what am I about? Yeah. So if you were to so we're doing an elevator pitch, so to speak. Oh, I, yeah, I, yes. Uh, 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 what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Can I Vulcan mind meld it with you? That would be. I would, I'd love to be a Vulcan, so I could mind meld in that way. Go ahead. Um, do we have everything? Yeah, working? I okay. we're fine. I was just grabbing the mic. Go ahead. So, I don't know if you know my health history. Besides serving and being a functional medicine practitioner. It has been the fickle finger of fate in my own life that I faced many serious illnesses. I mean, we're not talking insulin resistance or irritable bowel syndrome. Just for an example, I was diagnosed several years ago with going irreversibly blind. After having worked with all of the eye experts at the Austin Eye Institute here for 15 years and doing everything that they said to do, being a good little patient, getting the surgeries, the drops, seeing the experts, and finally at the end of this saga, I was surrounded by a group of caring professionals that put their hand on my shoulder with tears in their eyes and said, you better get a really tiny house and it should be one floor and you got to figure out how to turn your life down instead of up because this is what's going on with you. Long story short, because we're time limited, um, I realized that I had entrusted my eye health to these experts and that they didn't have the answers for me because when a doctor says there's nothing else that can be done, mm -hmm. I have come to learn that means they don't know anything else to be done. So I dove into the literature and I found some possibilities and I went back and tried to wanting to collaborate and explore with them and they yelled at me. They literally yelled at me and told me I had no right. I was a patient and I couldn't diagnose and treat myself. I didn't I wasn't an ophthalmologist. And they literally yelled at me, even that I'd done everything that they told me to do, and now we were at an impasse where I was looking at something so serious. Long story short, I now have better vision than I've ever had in the last 20 years with my glasses on, better than 2020. And the protocol that I put together is now being used by the Moran Eye Institute in Salt Lake City, which is the largest eye hospital in the world. People come from all over the world. And they would love me to go there and work with them. And they're, it's changed the way that they treat optic nerve disease and eye patients. They're treating more the patient that owns the eye, not just the eyeball that is within that person. So what I have learned from my life, from either serving patients or being a patient, is to never let somebody else's opinion drive the traffic of your life. Never take old or ill for an answer. Never. Never give up. There's so many ways. I mean, I've, I've lost seven and a half organs. I had multiple recurrent cancers. And now I have the best health in my older age. I have the youth that I wasn't able to deliciously embrace when I was younger. Because of that, I really know, don't let anybody else tell you how to walk your own parade. But it's hard because we live in a culture where we want all the experts to give us the five basic facts so on Monday we can get it all together. Exactly. 
But one of the things that I know, and I, and I know this in my life uh, with with my wife, and 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 is that they experts do not have all the answers. We have to be as patients. We have to be part of our care. We can't just turn it over and say, "Fix me," like a car going into a, a place. It has to be. It has to be a relationship. I mean, any time that we go to the doctor, I go with her or she goes with me because the other person takes the notes because it's very hard for the person who is going through the, to listen to the doctor to be able to understand and understand everything that's going on rather than to have some kind of objective perspective. We live in a society today that the branding are experts. You're a TED Talk expert, you're an expert in this and that, and that's what people want to hear and have, but the, it's, it's an illusion. It's an illusion that anybody knows a lot about anything, and more mistakes happen than not. More diagnoses are wrong diagnoses than not. Um, it's really, if you were to dive into all of this, so the bottom, but it's overwhelming for one person in the midst of a crisis, of a serious diagnosis. Exactly. But, and so it's really wonderful to try and start getting all your ducks in a row in your life I always think of planning for your life as though it were like the Iron Man. You figure, you know, I want to get, I want to get my body, mind, spirit, kind of watching my life back so that it's working. And so you start developing tools and people that you respect and team players so that things are somewhat in place, so that when um, severe trauma happens, which it does in every single life. You have vitamin R, resilience, and you've got some things in place so you're not starting from ground zero. How did you build resilience to go through? How, how, how did that, what are the, the, the ways that you built resilience? Because I, 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 I agree that, that the, the thing that has been most valuable for me is my willingness to get back up after I've gotten my ass kicked. Um, well, I think part of it is, is you know, my grandfather that stood on that yeah. soapbox that I come from a lineage of hard working people from Russia and Lithuania who were just very hard workers and realized that you, you know, so that's built in to my genes. But um, I basically, honestly, Dennis, I'm a hedonist. People ask me my religion uh, more than my true religion. I'm more of a hedonistic religion because I love to feel good. And I know that if I work out regularly, I have such a higher opportunity of feeling good. And if I eat well, I have such a higher opportunity of feeling good. And if I don't take a bad diagnostic, horrible dictum from a doc right. and I search for the answer, hell or high water, I feel better, especially when I now am no longer going blind. So I believe that we are put on this earth with a lot of tools with which to feel the best that we can feel, not meaning always giddily happy, but more peaceful. I think we have a lot of depression because exactly. everyone's screamingly fighting frantically for happiness, but I mean peace. But you can develop, the wise person, I think, develops the bigger and bigger tool bag for life. And the more you got the tools with whatever shows up, you can open up that bag and you can look in and pull something out. And the more you do that, I didn't expect, you know, the first few times I was diagnosed with serious cancers and things I did with the doctor, the expert in the white jacket sitting across the desk told me to do, even though I'm a doctor myself, you know, you really, once you're a patient, you're no longer really a doctor. But after, over time, when I realized that they didn't have the answers and I kept having recurrences, I realized I couldn't put all of my care into these guys because they didn't know it all. And I was really going to have to go off on my own way. Although I was already, most people when they get ill today, Dennis, pick up exercise and nutrition and organic food and then they get better and they've seen the light. Mm -hmm. The clouds part, the more metabolic and aqua choir plays and they're born again functional Aww. nutritional people. But I was already an athlete. My mother was an athlete, so I was a good daughter to model her. And I heard a lecture that you are what you eat when I was about 16, so I've been eating organically all my life, and I was still getting ill. So I had to figure out even deeper ways, which is part of my path, and part of that was about hormones, because my mother was given the most powerful estrogen, synthetic estrogen, ever invented in the world. It was given to millions of women for 36 years as a prenatal vitamin, 
or if she was spotting and they thought that the pregnancy was threatened, even though really early on there were hidden memos that it caused mammary tumors, which are breast tumors in rodents, which is what 90% of the daughters exposed to the first tri in the first trimester to that amount of prenatal vitamin bre got breast cancer, which is at a specific age, which is what I got. So um, my life was affected by hormones in the womb, and then I've ended up being mesmerized by the role of hormones. They're not just sexy and reproductive things. They run the whole show your brain, your gut, your vocal cords, your kidney. So I take a lot of the resilience and everything that I've learned and there's a focus on hormones and interestingly enough hormones help you have physiologic resistance. A lot of aging and frailty and rheumatism and all that stuff is is the shutting up of hormonal signals which you can reverse with hormone replacement. So um, if you put everything I was telling you about hope but you put it as a focus on hormones and nutrition in the gut. That's where I've been in, kind of in life. And one of the things I find fascinating because you're you're talking about delayed gratification. You want to, you know, you're going to feel better, but you don't feel better now. But we want instantaneous gratification. We want it instantly. But we're but you're able. You develop the the discipline to be able to know that if you if you work on it now, you're going to get there later. You know, my patients are always asking me, you're so lucky. You love to work out. Nobody totally loves to work out all the time. You love having worked out. That's yeah. where the hedonism <laughs> comes in. I love writing books, but nobody, the process of writing a book is, is awful. You're alone and you're sitting and you're, it's isolating and it's, it's very stressful. So really you love having written you know and I think discipline is a tool that you develop because you're very velcroed to the benefit and outcome of doing that you go this what I'm gonna get if I do this is worth it and I don't know why more people just don't say well if I work out regular if I do this if I do that it's worth it but most people don't seem to be able it's like the Dalai Lama said that happiness comes down to discipline and I think our society with the focus like you just said on instantaneous gratification or mm -hmm. every kid is amazing give them an award for everything don't really reprimand them and, and give good parental tough love you start having people that don't have the they don't even know what the benefit of dis discipline is of no. why should I have it and then they end up living a life where they have less control I, when I, things hit. I, I, I love that you say that because that, that, that's really one of the things that I, that where I bloomed so late is really understanding what the value of hard work was. I didn't understand it. I just, I always avoided it because I didn't you understand. You don't seem like that person now at all, Dennis. I'm not. But I, I have really worked through that. But I know that as a, as a teenager or as a, and, and certainly in my 20s and 30s, it was more of an avoidance of than understanding that the tenacity to do something and finish, that there was value in the activity as opposed to just wanting to achieve the result. Well, I think that our schools are all upside down. And I don't think that we should prioritize math and history and um, English as much as the skills that one needs to live a wise and resilient and disciplined life. And Wow, and that, that was wonderful. I put together a bunch of books that I haven't really figured out what to do with, but I think in the early, early grades you should learn about discipline, mindfulness, uh, kind res resolution, uh, breathing, all the things that now people are getting into, why aren't they d developed? And I think some schools are starting to do that a little bit. And I really think that that peace and carrying this out on a global level would occur if the last year of every high school all throughout the world was that every kid got to pick 11 countries and they stayed in one country for a month and another family looking at their religion and their food and how they lived, the next month they'd go to another country and dive into 
the heart of that community. And on the last month after they all did that, they go back to their schools for a month and they talk about what they saw, how they would improve things, how they think this would change their life, and they have their toes in the water of the global family of mankind. I love it. And, and so can we, can we construct that virtually? I mean, are there ways Ooh. that we can begin to do that? Because That's I, delicious. Because, because there... It's I, like I, telemedicine. I would, yeah. Uh, this, this, is there any way, because I find telemedicine to be, to be an interesting concept, because if we could, we can't make enough doctors to, to deal with this, uh, with the baby boomers and beyond that are coming in. I, I don't know that we are, but the only way I can see that we can, we can do this, or certainly not here in the United States, is to empower nurses, is to find out some way to drive down the, uh, and triage up to the physician. Is, is there? I mean, it's funny you should bring that up because I worked for almost 10 years in a dialysis center here in Austin. I work with Dr. Jack Moncrief and he spearheaded the idea of telemedicine and he signed in the Bush, uh, he signed in the bill with President Bush. He didn't sign in the Bush, he right. signed it with the Bush. <laughs> and he's got, that's pretty funny, the burning Bush. And he's got a picture of him signing that bill and he, he's a visionary and he saw that that was coming down the pike. Yeah. And I like your idea of that concept. And I think there's a, you know, I think that that we could use this in so many ways as we get people who are the fastest growing demographic are our aging demographic. In fact, centenarians is, are exploding. They're just exploding. And it would be great if we had more, pe because people are so isolated as they get yeah. older and pe their friends are dying and their family is whatever. And we have a society where we don't really caretake our aged. We put them into nursing homes. It would be great if we could use more um, virtual reality to make them part of a larger community of the world. Exactly, and, and, and we're close. We're getting there. I, lo I love your idea because, I mean, if you can put on goggles to where I can be part of my community, where I can actually be there, because I remember, David Key, when I was, uh, when I was a kid, I, re I remember, and I, w I was a kid in the, in the 1950s, and I would go to a, we would go to a nursing home, and, and I would go down the hall, and you'd see these people just parked in their wheelchair and just sitting there, just vegetating, and you see person after person. And this is what the nursing, and this was what was imprinted in my mind as to what, what a nursing home was like. And, I, and, I, and I, I, I've always known that that was a waste, that there, were, there must be a better way that we can do this than, than to have that kind of a, an well, experience. Well, you know, one of the things is that we are a very sick country. We have the first generation of kids who are going to die prematurely earlier than their parents did. We have the highest rate of maternal death. We have the highest rate of infant death the first year in, in affairs published several months ago where they compared 19 wealthy countries uh, for these mortality statistics of uh, maternal health and the first year of the infant. Uh, we're the worst, we're at the bottom of the heap. And on the other end of it, we have so much depression, so much anxiety, so much cognitive decline. So I think we have to figure out how to, in within living our life, plan the road better so that the end, the, the morbidity is more compressed and the value of life is more able to be lived by having better tools early on and not focusing on the math in the school and the grades of the test, but on giving someone a tool bag with which they can figure out how to train for their life like you know, 15 iron men and r really have tools that are effective for their everyday existence and for their future. I love that, David Key, because mm. the, if we teach someone how to think, they can solve so many things rather than teaching them a particular solution to a yes, problem. Yes, that is so exactly. Kind of the old fishing Exactly. Analogy, right? And so that's what we, uh, and that's what we can do. And we, so we can figure, we, I know it feels like that we're at a very transformative time in human history. You that say that a lot. So why do you feel that? Why do you feel it feels like that? Because, because I look at evolution, because I'm a believer in evolution. I believe that we evolved on, the, in this, uh, from uh, a 
single cell species all the way. I think that's a beautiful part. I think that's a gorgeous part. I see every reason for there to be a, a guiding principle to be doing uh, to be working. That's great. But but there is some there is this evolution. It doesn't appear to me why would there this be an end? Why would human beings human beings our sentience where we are be the end of it? Why would how would it cut off if, if we evolved from our uh, hominid ancestors and, and uh, Homo habilis and, and to Homo sapien, if we evolved to that, why would that be the end? Well, you know, it's very interesting because I was a scholar at a think tank at Tulane University in the med school, and we were focusing on pollutants in our dirty planet that alter our hormone signaling and are changing and threatening the human race. So um, Harvard and the Huffington Post got together January 31st of 2017 and put on a public forum. In fact, people could Google that forum. And a lot of the scientists I hung out with at Tulane were on that forum. And they were saying that there's three major threats to humanity. There's nuclear war. Mm -hmm. Then depending on who you vote for, there's global warming. And the third are hormone altering chemicals because those threaten our sperm count, our miles of reproduction, our ability. So, but yet at the last several symposiums we had, we had ways to remediate and um, to serve and clean up the planet. So there was hope besides there being Hello, everybody. Our editor, Jonathan Wilson, said we came up a little short this week, so we're going to go to the Wayback Machine, to an interview that I did on Reasonably Spontaneous Conversation in 1979 with one of America's great character actors and dialogue coaches, Robert Easton. Here's a snippet. I was the beau that uh, lost uh, Barbara Eden, and I don't understand either because I really I had a way with women. I mean, I, I, I really knew the right things to say to them. Like I, uh, I said to Pat Priest, who was a beautiful girl. She was the daughter of the treasurer of the United States, Ivy Baker Priest. Mm -hmm. And on a show, I said to her, I said, ma'am, you're just as pretty as a bucket full of hog livers. And I mean, when I, when I know how to say loving things like that, I don't know why I can't I get can't these women. I can't understand that. No, because I'm smooth. I mean, like one time I said to Barbara Lawrence, I, I took her out in the backyard and I said, look at them stars. Why, they're thicker than fleas on a hog's back. I mean, I, I, just, I just know all those loving things to say to women. Are there any characters that you'd like to play that you haven't? If I really don't outline. Uh, I just know that, uh, you know, phones are going to ring and I'm going to get opportunities to play all kinds of uh, interesting and, and exciting characters. Like the Shakespeare radio shows, I played six characters on those, <coughs> and sometimes like two or three in the same script. 